So I'm going to read a three page classic, The Stranger by Zimmel. If wandering is the liberation from every given point in space, and that's the conceptional opposite to fixation at such a point, the sociological form of the stranger presents the unity, as it were, of these two characteristics. This phenomenon too, however, reveals that spatial relations are only the condition on the one hand and the symbol on the other of human relations. The stranger is thus being discussed here, not in the sense often touched upon in the past, as the wanderer who comes today and goes tomorrow, but rather as the person who comes today and stays tomorrow. Tomorrow here means day or morning. He is, so to speak, the potential wanderer. Although he has not moved on, he has not quite overcome the freedom of coming and going. He is fixed within a particular spatial group or within a group whose boundaries are similar to spatial boundaries. But his position in this group is determined essentially by the fact that he has not belonged to it from the beginning, that he imports qualities to it which do not and cannot stem from the group itself. The unity of nearness and remoteness involved in every human relation is organized in the phenomenon of the stranger in a way which may be most briefly formulated by saying that in the relationship to him, distance means that he who is close by is far and strangeness means that he who also is far is actually near. For to be a stranger is naturally a very positive relation. It is a specific form of interaction. The inhabitants of Sirius are not really strangers to us, at least not in any sociologically logic relevant sense. They do not exist for us at all. They are beyond far and near. The stranger, like the poor and like sundry inner enemies, is an element of the group itself. His position as a full-fledged member involves both being outside it and confronting it. The following statement, which are by no means intended as exhaustive, indicate how elements which increase distance and repel in the relations of and with the stranger produce a pattern of coordination and consistent interaction. Throughout the history of economics, the stranger everywhere appears as the trader or the trader as stranger. As long as economy is essentially self-sufficient or produces or products are exchanged within a spatially narrow group, it needs no middlemen. A trader is only required for products that originate outside of the group. In so far as members do not leave the circle in order to buy these necessities, in which case they are the strange merchants in that outside territory, the trader must be a stranger, since nobody else has a chance to make a living. The position of the stranger stands out more sharply if he settles down in the place of his activity instead of leaving it again. In innumerable cases, even this is possible only if he can live by intermediate trade. Once an economy is somehow closed, the land is divided up and handicrafts are established that satisfy the demand for them, the trader too can find his existence. For in trade, which alone makes possible limited combinations, intelligence always finds expansions on new territories an achievement which is very difficult to attain for the original producer with his lesser mobility and his dependence upon a circle of customers that can be increased only slowly. Trade can always absorb more people than primary production. It is, therefore, the sphere indicated for the stranger, who intrudes as 
a supernumerary, so to speak, into a group in which the economic positions are actually occupied. The classical example is the history of European Jews. So supernumerary means um, superfluous or extra. The stranger is by nature no owner of soil, soil not only in the physical, but also in the figurative sense of life, of life substances, which is fixed, if not in a point in space, at least in an ideal point of the social environment. Although in more intimate relations, he may develop all kinds of charm and significance, as long as he is considered a stranger in the eyes of the other, he is not an owner of soil. Restriction to intermediary trade and often, as though sub sublimated from it to pure finance, gives him the specific character of mobility. If mobility takes place within a closed group, it embodies that synthesis of nearness and distance, which constitutes the formal position of the stranger. For the fundamentally mobile person comes in contact at one time or another with every individual, but is not organically connected through established ties of kinship, locality and occupation with any single one. Another expression of this constellation lies in the objectivity of the stranger. He is not radically committed to the unique ingredients and peculiar tendencies of the group, and therefore approaches them with a specific attitude of quote unquote objectivity. But objectivity does not simply involve passivity and detachment. It is a peculiar and particular structure composed of distance and nearness indifference and involvement. I refer to the discussion of the dominating positions of the person who is a stranger in the group. Its most typical instance was the, pra was the practice of those Italian cities to call their judges from the outside because no native was free from entanglement in family and party interests. With the objectivity of the stranger is connected also the phenomenon touched upon above, although it is chiefly, but not exclusively true, of the stranger who moves on. This is the fact that he often receives the most surprising openness, confidences, which sometimes have the character of a, confession, of a confessional and which would be carefully withheld from a more closely related person. Objectivity is by no means non-participation which is altogether outside both subjective and objective interaction. But a positive and specific kind of participation, just as the objectivity of a theoretical observation does not refer to the mind as a passive tabula rasa on which things inscribe their qualities, but on the contrary to its full activity that operates according to its own laws and to the elimination thereby of accidental dislocations and emphasis, whose individuals and subjective differences would produce different pictures of the same object. Objectivity may also be, defined, be defined as freedom. The objective individual is bound by no commitments which could prejudice his perceptions, understanding and evaluation of the given. The freedom, however, which allows the stranger to experience and treat even his close relationships as though from a bird's eye view, contains many dangerous possibilities. In uprisings of all sorts, the party attacked his, has claimed from the beginning of things that provocations has come from the outside through emissaries and instigators. In so far as this is true, it is an exaggeration of the specific role of the stranger. He is freer practically and theoretically. He surveys conditions with less prejudice. His criteria for them are more general and more objective ideals. He is not tied down in his action by habit, piety and precedent. Finally, the proportion of nearness and remoteness which gives the stranger the character of objectivity also finds practical expression in the more abstract nature of the relation to him. That is, 
with the, the abstract nature that is with the stranger only has with the stranger one has only certain more general qualities in common whereas the relation to more organically connected persons is based on the commonness of specific differences from merely general features in fact all somehow personal relations follow this scheme in various patterns. They are determined not only by the circumstance that certain common features exist among the individuals, along with individual differences, which either influence the relationship or remain outside of it. For the common features themselves are basically determined in the reflect upon the relation by the question whether they exist only between the participants in this particular relationship, and thus are quite general in regard to this relation, but are specific and incomparable in regard to everything outside of it, or whether the participants feel that these features are common to them because they are common to a group, a type, or mankind in general. In the case of the second alternative, the effectiveness of the common features become diluted in proportion to the size of the group composed of members who are similar in this sense. Although the commonness functions as their unifying basis, it does not make these particular persons interdependent on one another because it could as easily connect every one of them with all kinds of individuals other than the members of this group. This too, evidently, is a way in which a relationship includes both nearness and distance at the same time. To the extent to which the common features are general, they add to the warmth of the relation founded on them, an element of coolness, a feeling of the contingency, contingency of precisely this relation. The connecting forces have lost their specific and centripetal, centripetal character. In the relation to the stranger, it seems to me, this constellation has an extraordinary and basic preponderance over the individual elements that are exclusive with that particular relationship. The stranger is close to us in so far as we feel between him and ourselves common features of a national, social, occupational or generally human nature. He is far from us in so far as these common features extend beyond him or us and connect us only because they connect a great many people. A trace of strangeness in this sense easily enters even the most intimate relationships. In the stage of first passion, erotic relationships strongly reject any sort of generalization. You remember why I asked you, have you ever met somebody like me? Um, <laughs> The lovers think that there has never been a love like theirs, that nothing can be compared either to the person loved or to the feelings for that person. An estrangement, whether as cause or as consequence, it is difficult to decide, usually comes at the moment when this feeling of uniqueness vanishes from the relationship. A certain skepticism in regard to its value in itself and for them attaches to the very thought that in their relation, after all, they carry out only a generally human destiny, that they experience an experience that has occurred a thousand times before, that had they not accidentally met their particular partner, they would have found the same significance in another person. Well, uh, I just want to say that Zimmel actually cheated on his wife with his so-called best friend who was also an intellectual and that person actually helped save his wife and himself uh, during the world war because they were both Jews you know um, and on Zimmel's wedding uh, sorry on Zimmel's funeral his wife actually asked this woman have you ever had an affair with my husband and she said yes and actually they fucking had a child together that is how a lot of the um, manuscripts of Zimmel got, of this author, got totally um, destroyed by his, you know, exasperated wife, which in my opinion is absolutely justified. Anyways, maybe that's how he looked at his relationship with his, with women in general. I don't know, but, um, okay, just 
um, one thing that I want to mention. Okay, continue. Something of this feeling is probably not absent in any relation, however close, because what is common to two is never common to them alone, but is subsumed under a general idea which includes much else besides many possibilities of commonness. No matter how little these possibilities become real and how often we forget them here and there, nevertheless, they thrust themselves between us like shadows, like a mist which escapes every word to notice it, but which must coagulate into a solid bodily form before it can be called jealousy. In some cases, perhaps the more general, at least the more unsurmountable strangeness is not due to different and understandable matters. It is rather caused by the fact that similarity, harmony and nearness are accompanied by the feeling that they are not really the unique property of this particular relationship. They are something more general, something which potentially prevails between the partners and an indeterminate number of others, and therefore gives the relation, which alone was realized, no inner and exclusive necessity. On the other hand, there is a kind of strangeness that rejects the very commonness based on something more general, which embraces the parties. The relation of the Greeks to the barbarians is perhaps typical here, as are all cases in which it is precisely general attributes felt to be specifically and purely human that are disallowed to the other. But stranger here has no positive meaning. The relationship, the relation to him is a non-relation. He is not what is relevant here, a member of the group itself. As a group member, rather, he is near and far at the same time as is characteristic of relations founded only on generally human commonness. But between nearness and distance, there will arise a specific tension when the consciousness that only the quite general is common stresses that which is not common. In the case of the person who is a stranger to the country, the city, the race, etc., however, this non-common element is once more nothing individual, but merely the strangeness of origin, which is or could be common to many strangers. For this reason, strangers are not really conceived as individuals, but as strangers of a particular type. This is very important. I mean, for studies of racism or you know, exclusion uh, on a sociological lens. Um, but as strangers of a particular type, the element of distance is no less general in regard to them than the elements of, e of nearness. This form is the basis of such a special case, for instance, as the tax levied in Frankfurt and elsewhere upon medieval Jews, whereas the bead tax paid by the Christian citizen changed with the changes of his fortune, it was fixed once and for all for every single Jew. This fixity rested on the fact that the Jew had his social position as a Jew, not as the individual bearer of certain objective quantities. Every other citizen was the owner of a particular amount of property and his tax followed its fluctuations. But the Jew as a taxpayer was, in the first place, a Jew. And as his tax situation had an invariable element, this same position appears most strongly, of course, once even these individual characterizations are omitted and all strangers pay an altogether equal head tax. Sounds like how countries treat foreigners these days. In spite of being inorganically appended to it. The stranger is yet an organic member of the group. Its uniform life includes the specific conditions of this element. Only we do not know how to designate the peculiar unity of this position other than by saying that it is composed of certain measures of nearness and distance. Although some quantities of them characterize all relationships, a special proportion and reciprocal tension produce this particular form, formal relation to the stranger. The end of 